Gonioscopy and narrow angles. Whenever we examine the anterior chamber periphery and we find the shallow, then we have to do gonioscopy. The well-known Van Herrick sign, he used to compare the most peripheral part of the angle of the depth of the AC with that of the cornea. Recently, we get this term LCD measurement, the limbal chamber depth. We put the light 90 degrees to the periphery of the cornea <coughs> and we put the slit lamp 60 degrees from the source of light and we start to compare the thickness of the cornea with the depth of the anterior chamber in the periphery. If the anterior chamber has a depth of 50% or more of the thickness of the cornea, then angle closure glaucoma or susceptibility to angle closure glaucoma is excluded. While whenever the depth of the AC is one quadrant or less of that of the peripheral part of the cornea, then gonioscopy should be done because the possibility of angle closure is there. We have to keep in mind that the surface of the iris is not flat, it gets some elevations and depressions, so we make our judgment of in the narrowest part of the angle to compare the thickness of this narrow part with that of the cornea. We know that chronic angle closure glaucoma may follow acute attack and this is easy to diagnose. But we have another form of chronic angle closure glaucoma. It has no symptoms at all. It is, has a creeping closure of the angle and the clinical picture is quite similar to open angle glaucoma. There is no symptoms at all. So the only way to diagnose such a condition is to do gonioscopy. Which lens should we use? We have the Goldman one mirror and three mirror. The Goldman one mirror lens get a diameter of 18 millimeter or 15 millimeter, while the three mirror Goldman get a diameter of 18 millimeter. On the other hand, the Posner lens has a diameter of only 8 millimeter. This is the four mirror Posner lens, and this is the three mirror Goldman lens. You noted the difference in the size of the two lenses, 18 and 8. The Posner lens has an advantage that have a, has a curvature similar to that of the cornea. So we just can apply it directly to the cornea. We don't need to put any visco. Also, this lens has a diameter of 8 millimeter while the cornea get a diameter of 12 millimeter, so we can indent the cornea with this lens. Indentation means that we are going to press on the cornea. This is important to differentiate if we get an angle that looks closed. And we want to know if this is an actual adhesion between the iris and the cornea, or just mere opposition. So in this case of opposition, on indentation, the angle will open. On the other hand, in synical closure, everything will still be closed. This is the differential diagnosis between synical and oppositional closure of the angle with the indentation. Here, with the three mirror contact lens, we cannot do any indentation because of the corneal diameter the angle details are not seen. On applying the Zeiss lens or the Posner lens and doing indentation, the trabecular meshwork became apparent, so it's an actual case of opposition angle closure. Gonioscopy is usually done bilaterally. It's easy to use the Posner lens to switch between the two eyes, so comparison is easy and quick, and also as missile cellulose is not used, so there is no blurring of vision on the patient side. The disadvantage of the large diameter lenses is that they will cause the patient irritation, and the patient find it difficult to move his eyes to look to the direction of a mirror, which is an important sign I'm going to talk about in a minute. 
Keep in mind if you are going to use both the Pusner and the Goldman, it's better to start with the Pusner because we don't need any missile. If you reverse the situation and start with the three mirror, the missile used in case of three mirror will disturb you while doing the examination with the Pusner. On doing gonioscopy, we need to identify the Schwalbe's line, then we can tell for sure where the pigmented trabecular mesh work. Here, an example on an eye model to show the Schwalbe's line. We get here the iris, and here we have the ciliary body, and this is the opaque trabecular mesh work, and in front here we get the cornea. This model was put on a slit lamp and this video was taken. You notice as the cornea is transparent, this is the inner surface and this is the outer surface of the cornea and we get a wedge here. But down behind here the sclera is opaque so we don't have any section. So the Schwalbe's line is located between this part, the cornea with the two layers, inner and outer layer, and the opaque sclera with only we can see one surface. So this is the location of the Schwalbe's line, and what's behind is the trabecular meshwork. So this is the location and here we get the trabecular meshwork. If the trabecular meshwork is visible or not, then we can say this is an angle that is opened or angle that is closed. We should check the both the upper half and the lower half separately and make our judgment. If you can see the trabecular meshwork up and down in the whole 360 degrees, it's an open angle. On the other hand, if the trabecular meshwork is not seen up or not seen in the lower half, then it's a narrow angle. In this case, a narrow angle can be an occludable angle or closed angle. To diagnose an occludable angle, we ask the patient to change the way he's looking and to look toward the mirror we are using for examination. If the trabecular meshwork became becomes visible, then it's an occludable angle. If, we di if not visible, it's a closed angle. Then if it's a closed angle, we should differentiate between opposition and synechial closure by indentation. We can understand this by this example. This is the case where the gonioscope was done, was applied, and the patient is looking in the primary position. The surgeon can see the trabecular meshwork in the upper half and also in the lower half. So this is the case of an open angle. Another example, when doing gonioscopy, the trabecular meshwork is not visible in the lower part. So if we ask the patient to look down this will be the case. Now the line of sight can get reach to the trabecular meshwork and the trabecular meshwork becomes visible. So we know that we have an occludable angle. And if the trabecular meshwork is not visible, then we do indentation to differentiate between synechial and opposition. In case of synechia, with indentation, still we cannot see the trabecular meshwork. While in case of opposition with indentation, we can see the trabecular meshwork. So we have th three things to do while doing gonioscopy. First, the patient is looking in the primary position. Then we may ask the patient to look toward the mirror if the trabecular meshwork was not visible in the first place and also we need to do indentation if the trabecular meshwork is not visible. So this is the scheme. Trabecular meshwork seen up and down is an open angle. Trabecular meshwork not seen up or not seen down it's a narrow angle. 
this can be occludable or closed if ask the patient to look toward the mirror and if you can see the details of the trabecular mesh work it's an occludable angle if not it's a closed closed angle it can be a position or synical closure then we need we need to do indentation The three mirror Goldman lens is not recommended to use for angle examination because it's difficult for patient to look toward the angular mirror. One last thing about indentation gonioscopy. Indentation gonioscopy is important to differentiate between pupillary block and plateau iris. If we do indentation, we notice the shape of the peripheral part of the iris. In case of pupillary block, the peripheral part of the iris will become convex and the iris is movable. While in case of plateau iris, plateau iris we have the ciliary body, the ciliary processes are pushing the iris forward. So if we do the indentation, still the iris will be flat, it will not be convex and also the movement of the iris backward is limited so indentation is important to differentiate to some extent between pupillary block and plateau iris situation thank you for your attention